So the new 1 D&D drop is finally here and it's come with some updated races and a new cleric for us to check out. This is playtest material so we'll go through it from top to bottom and talk about what's changed, what's been buffed and what's been nerfed. So to start with, the lore of clerics is all basically the same. They draw power from the realms of the gods and work miracles. No big changes there. So talk about the actual cleric features. We've got the hit points which are the same as before, 1d8 per cleric level and you get the same proficiencies um, which is wisdom and charisma for saving throws and two of your choice from persuasion, religion, history, insight, and medicine. Then you get your light armor, medium armor, and shields, and simple weapons. This is all the same. But looking at the class features, we already have a major change, right? At first level, you have channel divinity. You gain the ability to channel divine energy directly from the outer planes, using that energy to fuel magical effects. You start with two such effects, Divine Spark and Turn Undead. Each time you use your channel divinity, you choose what effect to create and you get additional effect options at higher levels in this class. You can use your channel divinity a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So it used to be that you could use it once per short rest, but now they're giving you more flexibility. And long term, being able to use it, your proficiency bonus per long rest is more uses than getting it once per short rest. So, okay, so let's look at the first new thing here, the Divine Spark option. So, as a magic action, that's a new term, but it basically just means as an action, you can point your holy symbol at another creature you can see within 30 feet of yourself and focus divine energy at them. Roll a number of d8s equal to your proficiency bonus and add the rolls together. So up to level four, that's 2d8 from level five, it's 3d8, etc. You can either restore hit points to the creature equal to that total or force the creature to make a constitution saving throw. On a failed save, they take radiant damage equal to the total, and on a success, they take half that damage rounded down. So basically, you can always use your channel divinity to either heal an ally or damage a creature. I like the versatility there. Then you also get turn undead. As a magic action, you present your holy symbol and speak a prayer, censoring undead creatures. So I guess you can't do this under the effect of silence. That's worth noting. Each undead within 30 feet of you must make a wisdom save. If they fail, it is dazed for one minute or until it takes any damage or you are incapacitated or die. So the dazed condition is a new thing. Um, basically, when you're dazed, you can only move or take one action on your turn, not both. You also can't take a bonus action or a reaction. So what this reminds me of is the spell Tasha's Mind Whip, which basically did just this. Basically, it reduced someone to using only an action, their movement, or a bonus action on their turn. And it was a really good spell. This condition is actually awesome, not just because it's pretty powerful for players, but it's amazing for DMs. The stunned condition and the paralyzed condition basically sucked, because if you as a DM used them on your players, your players ended up just missing an entire turn of combat, and that sucked. It was really boring and frustrating for them. But now, with the dazed condition, you can kind of get that flavor of being you know, stunned uh, or whatever, but they can still do something. They can still take an action and it'll lead them to having to make this sort of tense decision on whether you run away or you commit yourself to standing there so you can't move, but you get like a swing in. I think this is a really useful condition for DMs to use against players. So at first level, you've got spell casting. That's basically the same as it always was. You prepare spells each day, um, all the same stuff. But here's a really cool thing, right? Holy order. So at second level, you've dedicated yourself to one of the following sacred roles, either on your own as part of a religious order. So you get to choose one of these. Protector. Trained for battle, you gain proficiency in martial weapons and heavy armor. This is an amazing ability. It used to be given to some clerics with their subclass choice at level one. Obviously, subclasses have been moved around. We'll get to that in a second. But now any cleric can pick this up if they want from level two, which if you're just playing a cleric normally, the difference between getting it at level one and level two, it doesn't really matter. So I don't see this as a nerf to clerics. This is actually a buff because now all clerics have access to it. Alternatively, you can take the Scholar Holy Order, where you get proficiency in two skills from among Arcana, History, Nature, Persuasion, and Religion. And whenever you make an ability check using either of those skills, you get a bonus to it equal to your Wisdom modifier. That's awesome. Wisdom is your primary spellcasting modifier. So this is basically saying by the time you reach maybe level eight, whatever skills you pick, you're going to be getting a plus five to those skills in addition to your proficiency and in addition to whatever your normal stat increase would be. Persuasion is probably the most powerful of these to take, but all of them are good. Finally, you get this Thaumaturge option where you can prepare one extra cantrip from the divine spell list. 
Also, you regain one expended use of your Channel Divinity whenever you finish a short rest, which is how the Channel Divinity used to work. So this is basically the Spellcaster one. It gives you an extra cantrip and more uses of Channel Divinity. It's probably the weakest, but if you want to really lean into the Channel Divinity, or if your subclass gives you a really good Channel Divinity, this could be the one to take. Do your walls suck? Oh god, this wall is awful! You need Displate, the awesome way to display your passions and get inspired. Displate have over one million designs from official branded sources like D&D, Marvel, DC, Star Wars and more. Each one is a high quality design printed on metal. Because metal is badass! And it won't crumple or tear like paper. Fact! Paper is the stuff people use to wipe their butts with. Do you really want that stuff on your wall? Metal is the future! Displate for life! But what if they fall on my head and I get brain damage and start thinking satyrs were a balanced race? Don't worry about it! They have a unique, safe, easy magnet mounting system. You don't even need to drill your walls or anything. When you use my discount code DND Shorts at checkout, you get an insane discount. It's coming up to Christmas. Displate is the perfect gift for friends, DMs, parents, orphans, or just for yourself. Remember to use code DND Shorts at checkout to get your displates today. Link in description. Okay, third level. This is the point where you get your cleric subclass now. They used to get them at level one, which was amazing for multiclassing, but they've moved them back to third to make multiclassing less overpowered, which it makes sense. It's kind of a bummer if you liked it, but it makes sense. There's also another sneaky buff to clerics here that isn't included in this list, but we'll get to that in a minute. But it's honestly the most, it's the weirdest buff ever, but it's kind of funny. At fourth level, you get a feat, same as always. At fifth level, you get smite undead. So you can use your turn undead feature to smite them. Whenever you use it, you can roll a number of d8s equal to your proficiency bonus and add the rolls together. So at third level, this is going to be 3d8 damage. And then each undead that fails the saving throw against that turn undead takes radiant damage equal to the rolls total. This is obviously quite cool, it's extra damage, but more importantly, this is very confusing. Because if we go back up to the original turn undead, it says that they are dazed until they take any damage. And this is immediately doing damage. So I assume the intent here is that they take the damage and then they're dazed, and the next time they take damage, the dazed condition ends. But it isn't clear and it needs to be clear because I can imagine some very finicky DMs saying, oh no, 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 if you ever use this smite undead feature, you can no longer daze undead, which is, is kind of rubbish. They'll obviously need to correct this in the future because even though I think it's kind of obvious that the damage would take first and then the daze condition would happen, the fact that it isn't clear in the rules is a problem. So, you know, that's something to give them feedback on. Anyway, this smite undead seems to be replacing the old version, which basically instantly killed any undead that were CR one half or lower. This one's obviously weaker if you consider that the old one instantly killed stuff, but it's better because the old one only affected really weak creatures, whereas this affects all undead. So as you get more powerful, this one is going to be the, the better one to have. At sixth level, you get your cleric subclass feature, and then at seventh level, you get blessed strikes, which we've actually seen before in Tasha's Cauldron and everything. Whenever a creature takes damage from your cantrips or an attack with a weapon, they take an extra 1d8 radiant damage but you can only do this once per round. It's basically an amalgamation of the old Divine Strikes and Potent Spellcasting. It works out at about an extra 1.5 damage, which is not nothing considering it's every turn for free. Then at 8th level you get a feat, and at 9th level you get your next Holy Order. So basically, whichever one of these you picked before, you now get to pick another one. What I imagine most clerics will do is pick Protector at level 1, because that heavy armor proficiency is just so good. And then, now you're level 9, your wisdom score's nice and high, your proficiency bonus is getting pretty high, you're gonna pick up the Scholar one to really buff a couple of skills, because they'll instantly be really good. That is, of course, assuming that you didn't get some completely ridiculously overpowered Channel Divinity out of your subclass at level 6, but we'll get to that in a moment. Then at 10th level, you get another subclass feature, and at 11th level, you get your Divine Intervention. Basically, as an action, you've got a 10% chance of calling God and having them show up and kick ass. It says the DM chooses the nature of the intervention and that the effect of any Divine spell is appropriate, so you can effectively cast a 9th level spell without a spell slot using this feature. 
if we just take a really quick look at the high level divine spells you might be able to grab with this, things like True Resurrection, Power Word Heal, Mass Heal, or maybe most excitingly, Gates. Literally, you can open a gate to your god and they can step through and kick ass, which is pretty cool. Also, there's been a tiny change here. It used to be that once you use this successfully, you couldn't do it again for seven days. Now it says that you can't do it again for 2d6 days. Then from level 12 to 18, it's kind of boring stuff. You get a feat, you get another subclass feature, you get another feat, and then at 18th level, you get greater divine intervention. So before, you used to have to roll a dice and potentially summon your god if you got lucky. But at 18th level, it just happens. You could just get to choose to use it. So that's obviously really powerful and really cool. It's basically the same as the old cleric version. Then you get your 19th level feat, and like all the subclasses are getting now, you get an epic boon at level 20. The one they recommend is Boon of Fate, which is probably one of the slightly more powerful ones. When another creature that you can see within 60 feet makes a d20 test, that's an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can roll a d10 and apply the number rolled as a bonus or a penalty to the d20 roll. Once you use this benefit, you can't use it again until you roll initiative or you finish a short rest or a long rest. So you can do this every single combat, basically. It's definitely gonna be good. This is an average of a 5.5 reduction or buff to something, which is usually going to be enough to force a creature to fail a key saving throw. Obviously that one's really powerful, but I do also like the boon of true sight, which just gives you true sight out to a range of 60 feet. It's not disgustingly strong or anything, but true sight is really good. And there's definitely some tactics and shenanigans you could pull if you ran a level 20 campaign and everyone took this. Okay, so we gotta talk about the updated Life Cleric subclass, but first, I wanna talk about the most surprising buff in this whole thing for clerics. Spiritual Weapon. The spell that often comes up in discussions of the strongest spells in the game for their level has been buffed. So obviously, just baseline, this spell is amazing. It is functionally a bonus action, extra attack every single turn. And it deals force damage, the best damage type in the game, and it uses your spellcasting modifier, so it's always going to be really strong. But the designers looked at this and they were like, yeah, it's ridiculously strong, but we can go harder, right? So now, whenever you cast a spell using a spell slot of third level or higher, the damage increases by 1d8 for every level above second. I've got the old one here to compare. It used to be when you cast it using a slot of third level or higher, it increased by 1d8 for every two levels above second. It just makes a good thing so much better, and I can honestly see other spellcasters taking a three level dip into Cleric just to get their hands on this spell. Okay, let's talk Life Cleric. Basically, this is the Healing Cleric subclass. This is the one you want to go for if you want to heal better than anyone else. First major change is obviously that this comes in at third level, not first level, and it used to give you heavy armor proficiency, but now all clerics get that, so it doesn't do that anymore. Instead, you get a Life Domain spell list, which is very similar to the old one. I'll put them on screen so you can compare the two, but there's nothing crazy different, except for, of course, the fact that you don't get any first level spell option. Then at third level, you get the Disciple of Life, which is very similar to the original with one huge difference. Your healing spells are empowered by life itself. When a spell that you cast with a spell slot restores hit points to a creature, that creature regains additional hit points on the turn you cast the spell. The additional hit points equals two plus the spell's level. So basically, this means the Disciple of Goodberry is no longer legal. It used to be that a cleric could take magic initiate for the spell Goodberry, which is a druid spell, and each berry would be restoring four hit points. So that would be 40 points of out of combat healing at the cost of a first level spell, which was crazy. So now they've said you can't do it, but of course, if you want to do it, just talk to your DM, right? Personally, I love that combo. I will still let my players do it, even with these new rules. And that's the great thing about D&D. At sixth level, you get another use of your channel divinity, preserve life. And I'm assuming this is going to be the same for all cleric subclasses, where they get an extra channel divinity use at level six. As an action, you expend one use of your channel divinity and present your holy symbol, restoring a number of hit points equal to five times your cleric level. Choose any creatures within 30 feet of yourself, including you, and divide those hit points among them. This feature can bring a creature's current hit points to no more than its hit point maximum. So the only real change I can tell between this one and the original is that this one works on any creatures, whereas the old one didn't work on constructs or undead. At 10th level, you get Blessed Healer, and it's basically the same as it always was. When you cast a spell that restores hit points to a creature, on the turn you cast it, so no good, Bree, you little, you little minx trying to break the rules you regain hit points equal to two plus the spells level. 
Obviously, the real difference here is you used to get this at level 6, and now you get it at level 10, so it's, it's 4 levels late. Finally, at 14th level, you get Supreme Healing. When you would normally roll one or more dice to restore hit points to a creature with a spell that you cast with a spell slot, you don't roll those dice. Instead, they just get the maximum. So basically, every healing spell you cast is always going to restore the maximum, which is almost doubling the efficiency of all your healing spells, which is very powerful. This is also the same as the old version, but this time you get it at level 14, not level 17. So that's three levels early, which is pretty nice. Okay, evaluation time. Clerics are often argued to be the strongest class in 5e. And I think from this UA, they are actually slightly better now than they used to be as a strict class. However, they are much worse as a multi-class. So before, tons of builds would take one level in Cleric for heavy armor proficiency and some extra spells and the Guidance Cantrip. But now if you want that heavy armor proficiency, you're gonna have to go to level two to grab it, which makes it not quite so easy for wizards to just pick it up. But for Clerics themselves, that doesn't really make too much difference. And having the option for heavy armor for all Cleric subclasses is a really tasty buff. I also really like these Holy Order options. They bring a little customization without going crazy. I do think that the Protector and the Scholar ones are the best too, but I can definitely see Thaumaturge being a fun option for someone who's just all about spells. Also, you really can't sleep on how good having extra channel divinities are if your channel divinity is really good. Like the Life Cleric one, it's okay, but the Tempest Cleric one, is insane. That's the one that maximizes the damage of any thunder or lightning spell. And if the Tempest Cleric makes it into one D&D being basically the same, that's going to be crazy good and way more fun because you get to play with that ability much more often. Remember to check out the DM secret weapon for hundreds of pages of awesome D&D content for you to add to your games. This month's issue includes a full rules expansion to the game featuring signature spellcasting, letting players craft their own spells named after themselves. You can check that out by clicking the link up here or down there, and I'll see you soon where we talk about the three updated races presented in this Unearthed Arcana. Remember to check out other videos on the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.